All right, folks, I think we're going to get uh, started with the last segment. Thank you for everyone who stuck around for this last uh, set of talks. We're actually on time, which is a plus here. So I'm, I'm going to talk about fractures of the pelvis and acetabulum. And um, you could dedicate an entire week, and there are courses, there are entire week-long courses that look at um, all of treatment of the pelvis and the acetabulum. So we are obviously not going to complete that in the next 20 minutes. Uh, but what I do want to accomplish is to get a better understanding of the anatomy, the imaging that we use, a little bit about the classification of these fractures because they will help tailor our, our treatment plan, uh, what we can do acutely after you sustain these injuries to help them have a better outcome, and then if there's some time, we'll do a case examples at the end. So the anatomy of the pelvis. The pelvis is three main bones, right? We have this, the, the sacrum or the tailbone, uh, and then the two innominent bones, which are composed of the uh, iliac wing, iliac wing, the ischium, and, and the pubis. So these bones, their, their articulations are relatively flat, right? They're not like balls and sockets or hinges. Uh, and so the pelvis gets its stability by the uh, complex uh, groups of ligaments that, uh, that surround these joints, both anteriorly through the pelvic floor and the front of the, and the back of the sacroiliac joints, as you see here. These ligaments are very intimate with the vasculature in the pelvis. And it's for this reason when we have widened pelvises or uh, open book fractures, uh, as they're referred to, you can get an idea of just how uh, dangerous they can be. You can, if you have disruption of the vasculature, the pelvis is wide, you can lose a lot of blood in a short amount of time, and they can be potentially uh, deadly. So there are various uh, classifications for pelvic fractures. Um, one that we tend to use, the more popular uh, classification system, is the Young and Burgess classification. And it's a simple classification, and basically it, you get the name of the subtypes by the mechanism of injury. And there's actually one classification that correlates with the severity of blood loss uh, and, and mortality. These are the three subtypes, and as you can see, their names describe the mechanism of injury. So the anterior-posterior compression, uh, this is sustained uh, with, with the force imparted on the pelvis from anteriorly to posteriorly, so a head-on collision, for example. And what it does, it will lead to external rotation of the hemipelvis, widening the pelvis. This is the open book, or what's referred to as the open book pelvis fracture. As the amount of energy increases, you can see you can go from just a simple disruption in the front to tearing of the ligaments in the pelvic floor to complete dissociation of the uh, hemipelvis. Or vice versa. All right, the second type is the lateral compression. So this is what you'll get in a car accident if you're T-bones. It's a force that's imparted from the lateral side. And what this will do is lead to internal rotation of the uh, hemipelvis. Unlike the last, where the pelvis is widened and these ligaments are ripped, this, is, this instead closes the volume of the pelvis and kinks those ligaments. So this is not as... Uh, 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 doesn't have as high of a mortality rate or risk of bleeding. Here you can see as the uh, subtypes increase and the energy increases, you go from just a fracture in the front with kicking of the, kinking of the, of the uh, ligaments and compression fractures to completion of the iliac wing fractures, or what we call a crescent fracture. And then eventually, if the energy is high enough, you can actually lead to external rotation of the opposite side, and, and that is what we refer to as win a windswept pelvis, and that does increase the pelvic volume and uh, requirement for uh, blood and hi higher mortality rate. The third type is a vertical shear. This we'll see with a, uh, a fall from a height, where uh, you'll actually have dissociation of all, all the articulations of the hemipelvis and vertical displacement. See, if we draw an axis, you can see that the right side is uh, elevated compared to the, the left. So this is a classic article out of shock trauma looking at a large um, series of high energy pelvic fractures. You can see that they, for the most part, are high energy injuries, motor vehicles, or pedestrians struck, and the most common uh, being the lateral compression type. What it also found was that the anterior posterior compression, as we discussed, is, probably, is, is the one with the highest mortality, uh, highest uh, need for resuscitation. So with pelvic fractures, you know, the workhorse or what we, we get generally is the AP pelvis. You know, an AP pelvis in the trauma bay never looks like this. This is actually a pretty good symmetric pelvis. But what we're looking for uh, to rule out a pelvic fracture is symmetry on, on these x-rays. 
What, what I like to do is, um, on, a, on a good AP pelvis, on which you can do it, is draw, basically drop a plumb line. So I'll try to be lining up the spinous processes and then have them cross right through the symphysis. And that's a nice axis off of which you can make comparisons. So if you were then to draw perpendicular lines, you, what you want to see is landmarks on each side of the pelvis lining up. So here you see the dome of both acetabulum is, is touched. Here is the teardrop from side to side. And you can see that there's no migration of, of the pelvic wing. For pelvic fractures, you also tend to get two more views. They're, no, they're uh, referred to as the inlet and outlet view. And the reason is, you see that when the patient is lying supine, the uh, pelvic brim is actually 40 degrees, 40 to 45 degrees of the um, uh, X-ray beam on an AP. It's also about 40 to 45 degrees of the true uh, plane of, of the sacrum. So in order to visualize these better, we'll get what's called an inlet view, which is uh, a beam that is tilted 40 to 45 degrees caudad, uh, and that'll get you a nice picture of the inside of the pelvis. And then for the opposite way, you'll get a nice AP view of the um, sacrum with a 40 to 45 degree cephalad view. So here's an example of that inlet. So what the inlet will show, again, you can do the same thing. You drop a plumb line and you can compare landmarks on each side of the pelvis. What this shows is displacement in the anterior to posterior plane. Uh, It'll also show you if there is external rotation of the hemipelvis in the case of the APCs or internal rotation for lateral compression subtypes. And just as a note interoperatively, this is the view that we use to get a nice axial cross-section view of the S1 body when we place our uh, posterior uh, sacroiliac screws. The opposite view is the outlet, uh, and this is that AP view of, of the uh, sacrum. And again, you can drop a plumb line compare landmarks on each side. And this is the view that's gonna tell you if there's vertical migration. So here, if this is actually a normal pelvis, but if this iliac wing was above the red line while it was uh, touching the top here, you would know that that right hemipelvis is vertically migrated. The other thing that this shows us is our nice views of the uh, sacral foramen that you wanna avoid again when placing SI screws. CT scans are uh, basically very good for giving us information about the posterior pelvis that can't really be visualized on, on the x-ray views. And 3D recons are very easy to get these days. They don't really help us acutely, but for the definitive ORIF procedures, they can be very helpful for preoperative planning. So a, a wide range of mortality has been reported in the literature, but what we do know is that mortality goes up when the patient arrives in the ER in shock uh, if they're older and if they have unstable fracture patterns. Uh, we know overwhelmingly that the most uh, deadly uh, subtype of fractures is the uh, APC3. So that is when all of the ligaments have been disrupted in that hemipelvis and there's complete dissociation and external rotation. So things to identify in the acute setting when the patient arrives. You want to you identify the unstable fracture patterns so you can take action and... Uh, <clears throat> and and do the appropriate resuscitation treatment uh, options. Uh, obviously, with any trauma, ATLS protocol, the ABCs, you want to rule out any other sources of bleeding. And the reason that we, we mentioned shock, and most studies refer to shock as uh, systolic blood pressure less than 90 upon arrival. Uh, as you can see that there have been multiple studies as early as 1980, and then as more recently as, uh, as uh, years beginning with a two, as someone mentioned before, I think that was Craig. Oh, that was you. Um, you can see the mortality uh, goes up significantly. So when a patient arrives with a pelvic fracture, there are a definite part of the physical exam that you don't want to miss. Uh, you're obligated to perform a perineal, rectal, and vaginal exam to rule out an open injury. Uh, urological evaluation can also, um, is also uh, indicated high riding prostate, uh, scrotal hematoma, blood at the meatus. Uh, any patient with any of these findings have bought themselves a retrograde urethrogram uh, before placing a Foley. And then, of course, associated fractures. Uh, it's actually not uncommon to have an associated ex uh, extremity fracture associated with, with uh, pelvic injury. <clears throat> 
So that this patient arrives in the trauma bay, what is the, you know, after they're evaluated by the trauma team, their, their uh, ABCs are done, what, what, what is the next step in management for, for this patient? Um, this is obviously an APC, probably an APC3. Um, patient is most likely, if not near shock, in shock. The one thing that you can do is apply some type of volume closing device, and that could be either a pelvic binder that they make that's prefabbed, or you can just apply a sheet. It's quick, it's easy, it's low cost, um, and it's very good at obtaining reductions of these APC fractures. So this is the same injury. This is actually at a, a case series by Chip Route when he was in Harborview. See, there's an APC3. Sheet is applied. You can see the towel clamp. You see how nicely it closes up their pelvis and reduces it. So the one pitfall when applying a sheet is that uh, sometimes it's applied incorrectly and it can actually uh, make the deformity worse. So here's an example of how to apply a sheet. And one of the common mistakes is to make the sheet too thin. You want to make it pretty wide. You want to make sure the top of the sheet is above the iliac wings and below the greater trochanters. You have a short end and you have a long end. First thing you do is take the short end, pull it in one direction. Another person takes the long end, folds it over, and then towel clamps are applied above and below. And it's simple and easy. One other consideration in acute management of these fractures is whether traction is indicated. And for a vertically unstable fracture that is migrating vertically, then you know, the patient really should be placed in uh, inline traction. So what is the role of angio and embolization? Well, um, we know that our, you know, embolization is for an arterial injury, right? It's not really for venous. And we know that the majority of bleeding or hemorrhage from pelvic fractures is actually a venous cause, not arterial. And that's been shown in multiple cadaver studies. What uh, Starr showed, uh, in, in actually in a, in a couple of papers, but this is, this is actually uh, from the OTA in 2006, was that uh, if you establish a protocol at your center where patients are placed in the binder, given fluid resuscitation, and if they don't respond to that uh, resuscitation, they're then sent to angio. Angio is only, only ends in embolization when there's an arterial cause. And what he found was that if you looked at subgroups where there was higher mortality with unstable fractures, he was actually able to reduce mortality significantly in two of the subgroups, those with, that came uh, in shock and with unstable fracture patterns. And there was also a trend towards an improvement in mortality in that older age group. So patient comes in with an unstable uh, pelvic fracture, regular ATLS ABCs, pelvic binder, fluid resuscitation, and then if that doesn't help, then they, they go to angio. And then that reduces mortality. So here's a case, um, a 44-year-old male pedestrian struck, high energy injury. Uh, he arrives with an obvious deformity to his pelvis. He's in shock. He also has a, a left femoral shaft fracture. This is his AP pelvis. So this is obviously an APC3, right? So there was an actual, actual dissociation of the entire hemipelvis to the point where we were able to do a closed reduction of that hemipelvis. Uh, then a sheet was applied. He then responded to fluids and blood, and you can see his systolic blood pressure in, in, improved. He was admitted overnight uh, into the ICU, brought to the operating room the next day, and the uh, sheet was removed. We plated the front of the pelvis, closing up the symphysis, and then the uh, SI screw that we talked about previously. And I think there's, you can see that the vertical height was restored. So any, any, uh, any questions on pelvic fractures? All right, so acetabular fracture. So the acetabulum is simply the socket of the ball and socket joint, right? It's been described as a joint that's suspended between two columns, right? Basically the anterior and the posterior column. And it gets its strength through its attachment. It's suspended from the sciatic buttress, which is the hardest bone in the body, definitely the hardest bone in, in the pelvis. So the acetabulum is... is as, again, has been described as being uh, suspended between two columns, the anterior column being uh, consisting of the uh, anterior iliac wing, the anterior half of the socket, and then the pubis, while the posterior column, which is uh, indicated by the red here, is the retroacetabular surface, what we call the quadrilateral surface, which is the inside of the pelvis on the other side of the socket, and then the ischium. Again, these tend to be higher energy injuries, 
and they could be, uh, and, and, and the classification we tend to use is that of, of Leigh Tornell, who is basically the father of acetabular surgery, uh, who produced a huge textbook of, you know, over eight or 900 uh, acetabular fractures and when, was able to classify them into 10 types. And quite simply, they could be grouped into elementary and uh, associated types. The elementary being the simpler uh, group, these tend to be fractures with just one fracture line. They tend to be just, sorry folks, just the wall or just the column, or one fracture line involving both columns, which you call the transverse fracture. And we'll get into a little later. The associated fractures are more, they're higher energy, uh, they're more complex, they involve more than one fracture line. These are combinations of columns and walls or more than one fracture line. So much like evaluating uh, pelvic fractures, we also have things to look for on AP pelvis when it comes to the acetabulum. There's basically six lines that we try to make a practice of looking for when we're suspicious of, a, of an acetabular fracture and also want to try to classify what type it is. So we'll quickly go through the six lines here. So basically, if you look at the pelvic brim, right, it'll either, you can follow it as a line into the top of the pubis or into the ischium. And these are what we call the iliopectineal and the ischial line. And what they delineate is the anterior and the posterior column, respectively. These two, uh, then we have the, the acetabular dome, which is just the joint line. Uh, we have the uh, teardrop that, that, that we very readily see on, on an x-ray. And this is actually a combination of two structures. The medial is actually the quadrilateral surface on the inside of the pelvis, while the more lateral line of the teardrop is the bottom of the cotyloid fossa. Uh, the last two are the walls. You see these, these two walls here. This is actually the anterior wall. The more lateral is the posterior wall. We know the, the hips are anverted. So if they're anverted, you're gonna have your posterior walls more lateral if you're taking a front to back view. So much like we had specialized views for the pelvis, we have the same for acetabular fractures and these are called judaes. And instead of uh, aiming the beam differently, we'll actually rotate the patient. We'll rotate them to the right and the left about 40 degrees. And this allows us to look at the uh, pelvis uh, from different views, and again, we get a better idea of what the columns and the walls look like. So this view here, if we're looking at the right pelvis, this is what we would call an iliac oblique. This is the view where we see more of the... iliac wing. This is how it gets its name. What, what, what we'll see on this is the posterior column. I think that's uh, by the, delineated by this uh, yellow line. And what this will consist of is the sciatic buttress, that quadrilateral surface, which is the inside of the pelvis, which is, the, which is basically on the other side of the socket, and then the ischium. The other thing we'll see is the anterior wall. So before the anterior walls were more medial, right? We would see the, the uh, posterior walls laterally. But if you were to rotate out, what you're seeing more is that anterior hip coming forward. So we'll see a posterior wall, I mean a posterior column and an anterior wall on this view. If you're looking at the left hemipelvis, it's the opposite, and we call this the uh, left obturator oblique. It's on this view that we see more of a face-on view of the obturator. This shows us the opposite. This shows us the anterior column, which consists of the anterior portion of the crest, the bone between the ASIS and the AIIS, and then the pubic symphysis. So while this shows you the anterior column, it also shows you the posterior wall. I know it's a lot to, to, to take in at once, but the take home message here is if you have an acetabular fracture, order the Jude views, because it's very useful. So real quickly on, on a CT scan, one great rule of thumb is you can kind of tell or get a clue on what's involved in an acetabular fracture by the direction of the fracture line on axial cuts. Oblique fractures tend to indicate a, a wall fracture while those that go in the uh, coronal plane tend to involve columns. And while it's counterintuitive, counter lines that exist in the sagittal plane tend to be a transverse type fracture. So I want to specifically pick out transverse and look at it. Um, so this is, this, is, this is, remember, this is that only simple type that involves both columns. It's one line, but goes through both columns. Um, <clears throat> and here's, here's an x-ray. So these are the two sides of the fracture, and what you'll see is that it actually involves all the lines that we talked about, or most of them. 
So here's that, here's that pelvic brim, brim line that goes into the iliopectineal and ilioischial, the anterior and posterior columns. You see that they're both disrupted. Pretty high, but they're both, both uh, disrupted. You'll also see that the lines go through both wall, um, I'm sorry, bo both, through both the anterior and posterior walls. So it's, if we look at it here, and as I showed you before, it's that vertical fracture line on the axial cuts that delineate a transverse fracture. If you can imagine, as you're scanning through the fracture going from top to bottom, all it's gonna look like is one line going from anterior to posterior, but as you're going from superior to inferior, that line will move from medial to lateral, which is what you see here. You see it's medial, more lateral, more lateral, more lateral until it comes out the bottom. One important thing to go over, especially for treatment of fractures in the acute setting, is a fracture dislocation of the acetabulum. Uh, this comes in, this merits a, an immediate reduction. So it's not after uh, head lack is, is sewn up or after they go to CT or after whatever, it needs to be put in immediately and definitely before a CT scan, because the CT scan is actually something important for preoperative planning for these type fractures dislocations. Uh, what we're looking for is a, is, is a congruent reduction. I uh, want to make sure there are no incarcerated wall fragments, and if there is, and if they're large, that some folks consider that, or some orthopods consider that surgical emergency, and uh, the patient's going for the, the definitive ORIF uh, sooner than later. We also look for intraarticular fragments that we'll, that we'll know uh, we'll need to go and search for and fish out when we eventually get the patient to surgery. Um, if the fracture is non-operative and they have these uh, small fragments, that's something that you might want to send to a sports specialist to eventually get scoped and plucked out. Um, and the other, and probably most important of, of all these, is marginal impaction. And what's, what's meant by that is, let's look at this fragment right here. This fragment here is actually uh, an osteochondral fragment that should match up with the femoral head here. But what happened was when the fracture dislocated, it uh, pushed, rotated, and, and pushed that, that segment into the cancellous bone. So not only is it displaced, but it's actually probably rotated about 90 degrees. That is something that you need to look for and repair intraoperatively. Here's an example of where it was not fixed. Um, here's the, obviously, this is post-op. Here's a plate with screws. The marginal impaction w w w was never reduced. Right? This here should line up and be concentric with the femoral head. And so th this will lead to a poor result possibly instability, but more likely post-traumatic arthritis. <clears throat> what needs to be done instead is you need to find that piece of marginal impaction. It needs to be lifted. That usually leaves a void as it was pushed into, into cancellous bone. That void is filled with something, graft, uh, synthetic bone filler, and then the hardware is, is placed. The other thing to consider after a reduction of a uh, fracture dislocation is whether the patient should be put in traction. Uh, that's a judgment call, or sometimes a judgment call. If the pattern just looks like it's unstable and, he's, and the patient's likely to dislocate again before the eventual surgery, that's the reason to put him in traction. Uh, you can also range the patient after the closed reduction to about 60, 70 degrees. Uh, if, you feel, if you feel it re-dislocate or, or any types of in, any signs of instability, uh, then the patient should be put into traction. So here's just a quick case example. This is a 42-year-old female, fell downstairs, otherwise uh, pretty healthy, um, arrives stable. Um, one leg is shorter than the other, complaining of pelvic pain, tense abdomen. So here you see here, so if we Again, we got the Jude view, so this is your AP view, and we'll see that there is disruption, uh, again, of both of those lines from the pelvic brim uh, more distally. So that ant uh, iliopectineal and the ilioischial line, bo both disrupted, invo indicating involvement of both columns. We got Jude views, very helpful. Looking at the anterior column and the posterior wall. This actually turned out to be a both column. We didn't go over this, but this is a pretty classic spur sign where the iliac wing is fractured off and basically all that remains is um, part of the uh, articular surface. And then this is the iliac oblique, which would indicate that 
posterior column on the inside of the pelvis. So we're actually rotating the patient outwards uh, and the anterior wall. So this patient was uh, reduced. She was put in traction. All right. And this is her in traction. You can see that there's distraction across the joint. That's definitely a widened joint space. But the hip center is more underneath the iliac wing, and there's not as much protrusio or displacement of the uh, retroacetabular sur or the quadrilateral surface uh, into the pelvis. So this patient returned to the operating room a couple days later, and we approached the fracture through an anterior approach. And th th this fracture can be uh, approached either through a large incision involving this entire line, which we call the ilioinguinal approach. Uh, we work between the iliacus muscle and the uh, uh, great vessels uh, to gain access to the anterior column. Or we can just do what the trend is, if, if we can get away with it, and we, we, we try to, so it's much less morbidity and less invasive is what we call a stop approach or a modified stop approach where we do a, a fan and steel incision, um, approach the anterior pelvis, we'll make a lateral window, and working through both sides, we have access to the wing as well as the internal pelvis, and that's what we did here. Here we fixed the, uh, the iliac crest portion of the plate with a uh, lag screw and then a neutralizing uh, plate. And then we're able to slide a specialized plate uh, from one window to the other underneath the muscle. And what this did was give you extra fixation on the anterior column. And this portion is actually 90 degrees to the anterior column portion. And it actually buttresses that portion that was medialized. And this is her at 11 weeks. Um, she actually was uh, visiting family from overseas. She is back in India, um, but this was her uh, most recent follow-up, 11 weeks, at which point we advanced her weight bearing and she was healed. All right, so the take-home points for, for uh, pelvic fractures, identify the high-risk patient. Uh, identify the patient that needs resuscitation immediately in the form of fluids or blood. Apply a binder for the for the appropriate fracture patterns, mainly the open book or APC subtypes. Look for symmetry on x-rays. That'll cue you in on, on, a, on a, a, a pelvic disruption. And then um, be mindful of when you need to use a pelvic sheet binder and when a patient should go to angio. For uh, acetabular fractures, remember the six lines, get in the practice of looking at them, and that'll cue in on whether a uh, acetabular fracture is, is, uh, is actually present. You want to get the specialized Jude views. They're very helpful for preoperative planning. A post-reduction CT of any fracture dislocations to rule out worrisome findings, especially the marginal impaction, and then apply traction for unstable fractures. Any questions?